Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Now, the command to be holy is not a command of you got to do it, you got to do it in your power. The command to be holy is God has made provision and empowered you. Now live out of that which is in you and stop living like, like you used to live. You can't live like you used to live. It doesn't work. How many found that it didn't work before? It did not work before. All right. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, and, and if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges every, according to every man's work, pass this time of your sojourning here in fear. Now, I'll be honest with you. This, some of the stuff that Peter said was so contradictory to what the uh, radical graces were preaching, they actually got some of those people going around and started saying that Peter shouldn't be in the Bible because he contradicted Paul. They really started saying that. Because scriptures like this went against what they taught. And so they started teaching that Peter shouldn't be part of the canon because Paul preached, Paul was a true preacher of grace, and this contradicts grace, therefore we shouldn't be in the Bible. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, it gets crazy. See, when you start, when you start down the road of going to the Bible to support your mantra instead of the Bible create your mantra, you get into trouble. Amen. No, we always have to stay open that when we come across Scripture that contradicts what we believe, we have to change. Because forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It doesn't change. Amen. It doesn't change. You have to change the line up with it. I don't care if they did write the Queen James Bible. And they did. Yep. The Queen James Bible. All the scriptures that deal with homosexuality, they rewrote them so they don't make homosexuality a sin. And call it the Queen James Bible. Anyway, we'll leave that alone for today. For, they said that, look, because God judges them, every man doesn't respect the person when he judges them. He says, take the time of your sojourning here in fear. In other words, be in awe, be respectful, be watchful of how you live, how you conduct yourself. <clears throat> for as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain lifestyle received by the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We, we kind of just kind of got off some different directions last week. We had some different people here. And I tell you, you get different people, they'll draw you in a different direction. <clears throat> Sometimes they'll draw you in directions you weren't going to go or that, you know, because of the need that they have or however they're drawing, they'll just pull you in a different direction. And so we, you know, uh, we, we missed some things that I wanted to cover last week. So let's get in here. Number one, precious out of Webster's dictionary means highly valuable and costly, highly esteemed cherished or beloved. The blood of Christ is precious. Now you had um, one of our mainline denominations went out a few years ago and said we're going to remove all the references uh, and all the songs that talk about the blood from our hymnals because it makes us a heathenistic religion. Now they're all supporting gays. This particular denomination supports gay marriage and all this gay stuff and they were taking the blood out a few years ago. So you can't you can't you cannot devalue the power of the blood of Jesus and continue to live the way God wants you to live. Why? Because Revelation says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. We got a lot of charismatics running around, I mean, word of faith, charismatic. People running around had a great confession but don't have any respect or, power or understanding of the power of the blood of Jesus. Amen. There's power in the blood. And you can't remove that from anything. Why? The very covenant that we're sealed on, that we make our confession from, is sealed by the blood of Jesus. We're to hold it in high esteem. Honor and respect the power of the blood. Now, you're going to, be, you're going to act like a little bit of a Pentecostal this morning. That's a Pentecostal message. But with the precious... Blood of Christ. Look over, in, look over, into Hebrews chapter nine. You think you know, by the time you're my age, your voice would have finally changed. Apparently, I haven't reached. You know, I'm still in adolescence. I haven't quite reached over yet. <coughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm heading for 120. I'm, you know, I'm not even halfway there yet, am I? Hebrews chapter nine. 
Verse 19, when Moses, dear Lord, doesn't look as good on camera, but who cares? When Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats and water with scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this, don't mind the old covenant blood, is the blood of the testament which God has enjoined unto you. You've been joined unto something. You've been, you've been joined unto an oath of God. God gave a word. And in that word, he gave an oath. And in that oath, he took it and ratified it with blood. Yeah. Maybe the blood covenant. The, the oath was just not, I promise you, there was bloodshed to secure and ratify that covenant so that it was not something just passed away. It was not just something that you just kind of looked at and went and kind of flippantly looked at and saw he gave me his word. His word. Blood was shed to guarantee that this would come to pass. And he enjoined it unto them. Praise be to God forever. Hallelujah. Moreover, he sprinkled both the, with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Almost all things <clears throat> are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in heaven should be purified with these. Now, in other words, that, and we talked about this last week a little bit, the tabernacle, remember, if you, if you go back and study the Old Testament, and when Moses, particularly when God was giving instruction to Moses about the tabernacle and then scriptures that revolve around the tabernacle, one of the things the Bible says about it is that Moses created the tabernacle according to the pattern which he saw in heaven. He saw into heaven and saw all the chambers that he created on the earth. He saw the, 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 the heavenly worship areas laid out like he saw on the earth. Now, if you were to go up over top of, of, of if you were to kind of go in there and take all the writings about the tabernacle and lay the tabernacle out and then cut the top of the tent off and go up and look down over it, if you, the, the, the furniture and the, and the furnishings in the tabernacle create a cross. Okay? And as, you know, if, you know, looking at it straight on, you don't see it, but when you're up over top, there it is. It creates a cross. Okay, before, before Romans ever started executing people by, by crucifixion. And so uh, we, we see this. And so that Moses, when he created it, created a, a tabernacle according to what he saw in heaven. He saw into heaven and saw these things. Now, this, that we can learn a lot from this because how the worship was done, how the sacrifices were made, tell us you know, what, things about the fall of man and the, redemptive, the redemption of man and the ne things necessary. Now, one of the things is that the, into the Holy of Holies, the holy place where God's throne, where God came down and sat on his throne in the, in the tabernacle and then eventually the temple, when God came down and sat, he sat at the far end of all the furnishings on the throne and between him and the curtain of the holy of holies, was the mercy seat. Okay? Was the mercy seat was there in front of his throne. Now, the Bible says that it was necessary that the pattern of things be cleansed with these. That's talking about the blood of bulls, goats, ashes of a half, and so forth. Okay? So when they, they went in, they, 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 they did things out in the courtyard. They did things in the, in the holiest, holy place, and then they did things in the holiest of all. The one thing they did in the holiest of all was they took the blood and went to the mercy seat. They did not go to the throne. They went to the mercy seat, and the mercy seat was cleansed for another year with the, those bloods of earthly things. Now, what we learn from this is Adam's authority went to the, as far as the mercy seat went in the real heaven. That's it. Adam's authority did not include the throne of God. It went up to but did not include the throne of God. That's how far Adam's authority went. That's why Satan was able to come in the book of Job up to the presence of God and accuse the brethren. Because that's how far Adam's authority went. That, well, we know that everything had to be cleansed wherever sin went. Sin did not touch the throne of God. It went to the mercy. That's how it got up to the mercy seat. It did not get the throne of God. In heaven itself, it got up to, but it did not include the throne of God. God was not tainted by the sin of Adam. God had given him the authority over all the works of his hands. Hallelujah. 
Adam sold out. Then and then God brought and instituted the sacrificial offerings to cover man until he could bring Jesus into the earth so that the spotless lamb could redeem mankind. So during the earthly practice, see, things had to be done. So man, and I'm going to tell you, the, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests, the high priests, the, the priests should have known Jesus without even thinking about it because everything he did was in relation to what they'd all been doing for all these uh, decades, centuries, and millennia. Trying to, you know, come to God. It was all right there for them. God gave them, a, God gave them stained glass windows. Now, if you've ever been to Europe and traveled any, and, you know, and every time we, uh, we've been in Europe, and of course, and I've been in Europe by myself and the family's gone with me, we go to, if any town we're in, we try to go to one of the big cathedrals. Just, just because of the architecture, they're beautiful. The way they, you know, they, to think that, you know, in five, six, seven, eight hundred years ago, they were building these 80 foot, 90 foot tall ceilings with these arched stones that were hewn out. But all, all the stained glass windows, see, because the Catholic Church didn't let the common people have the Bible, they told the stories with stained glass windows. You were supposed, you were supposed to be able to look at the stained glass windows and figure out the message. Because, you know, you're going to come in there, you speak, you speak Italian, they're going to do the, the, the mass in Latin. You know, you're sitting there going, oh, look at the pictures. Oh, okay. Well, God, did, God gave them the stained glass window in the tabernacle and all the offerings and all these things. These were all the things he was showing them what was necessary to redeem mankind and to cleanse heaven itself. And so everything that the high, that the high priest was doing in the earthly tabernacle, Jesus went in and did in the heavenly. Okay. Man, when, when they would go into that holiest of all and put the blood on the mercy seat, the, now this was, about, it was atonement. It was a covering. It wasn't a purchasing. Under the old covenant, they were atoned for. They were not redeemed. Okay? And, and I know it's used one time in the King James New Testament. It's, 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 just, it's just a mistranslation. They just, they just used the wrong word. And they did it from a, from a theological standpoint of that, well, that's the word that's been, been being used, and so we're going to use it. But it's really the wrong word. Just like the word Easter is in the New Testament, and it ain't in the Greek. The word translated Easter was Paschal in the, in the Greek. Passover. They just did it because that's what it, that, the, the Druids and all of them were, were all with all the heathens, and they just put it in there and changed it. Just, it's, it's Ishtar, Easter was the, he, it was the in English rendering of Ishtar, the Greek goddess of fertility. It's not in the Bible in Greek. So you're more correct to say Passover. Paschal. That's where the word came from. Okay? So God says here in Hebrews, Paul, I believe, writing here says, it was therefore necessary that the pattern, remember this is the pattern, of things in the heavens should be cleansed or purified with these. But, now see here, the blood of bulls and of goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer could not cleanse man's sin spiritually. It could push off and atone for a year. One year, boom. Next year, guess what? They were still there. How many have ever cleaned up, and when you cleaned up, you just stuffed it under the bed, stuffed it in a closet? People walk in and go, well, your house is clean. Don't open the closets. Why? Because it's still there. Amen. And it can sit behind that door for a year. You just sit behind that door for a year, you open it and throw some more stuff in it. And that's how sin was with man. It was shoved in there and shut the door and shoved in there and shut the door and shoved in there and shut the door. Year after year after year after year. But it never went away. Hello? It was still there. It was hidden. It was covered. For another year, you could live free from its penalty and guilt of what was all in there. But next year, you had to cover all that again. And the, and, and the year that you lived in. So everything that was ever there before was still there. It was covered. And then when next year got here, you uncovered it, put the other stuff on it, and then had, had sacrifices made to recover all of it again. And that just went on year after year after year after year. Okay? And so they were atoned for. They were covered. But when Jesus came, he did not come to bring atonement. He came to bring redemption. Hallelujah. He loaded up the truck and took it all down to Goodwill. Are you here? He backed the truck up to, the, well, excuse me. Uh, he loaded up the truck and took it all down to the Salvation Army. <laughs> 
Ja. Hallelujah. And so it says here, it was therefore necessary that the pattern of these things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For, listen, if all we ever got was covered, we would never have eternal life. The Old Testament saints went to Abraham's bosom in, in awaiting for the promise. They died in faith, had not, having not been made perfect, that they without us should not be made perfect. They died in faith. But they went into Abraham's bosom awaiting. They went awaiting the promise of redemption. They weren't suffering, but they weren't where they wanted to be. They were in a holding tank. <clears throat> now, I don't know if this is where the idea of purgatory came from. There's no such thing as purgatory. Okay, you don't go out and float around and wait to get better or whatever. That's, that's not a biblical concept. The closest thing we have to it is the Old Testament saints waiting in Abraham's bosom. And it wasn't that they were going to get better in that time. They were waiting for Jesus to finish the work so they could go to heaven. Okay, the way wasn't there yet. See, until Jesus came, you couldn't go to heaven. You could go to Abraham's bosom, but you couldn't go to heaven. You had to wait. They had to wait for Jesus to show up. Oh, my. I said, oh, my. Hallelujah. But the heavenly things, glory to God, um, themselves were better sacrifices than, than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands. See, he didn't come to fix the... Remember, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. The Holy Spirit does signify that the way to God was done. You wouldn't, this is it. This is the end of that priesthood. It's over. This is all done. Hallelujah. I mean, glory be to God. The, I mean, just rip that thing in half and say, this is over. God, this, this is God's not going to dwell in here anymore. He's not dwelling in a temple made with hands of men. He's not going to hide behind a curtain anymore. The whole reason of redemption is to reconcile humanity to the Father so he can dwell in his creation once again. Not be separated from him, but be enjoined to him. Glory to God. Amen. Not men into the holy place made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often. <clears throat> As the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others, for then must he often suffer since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Glory be to God forever. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And we better back up here. Back up to around verse um, Six. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests were always the first uh, into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But in the second went the high priest. Now, who was Jesus? He's the high priest of our confession. Amen. Hallelujah. Into the holiest of all not, uh, was not man made yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was standing. Yet was a figure of the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Oh, glory be to God. I said, glory be to God. I said, glory be to God. Think about that. You put all the stuff in the closet and you shut the door, but guess what? You know what's back there. Yeah. Now, the neighbors may come in and look around your house and not know what's back there. They might suspect it, but they don't know it. But you know it. And every year, they were reminded year after year after year, there's stuff in that closet. There's stuff in that closet. Now, I've got a, I got a reprieve for another year. The sacrifice has been made. It's covered for one more year. But there's stuff in that closet. But Jesus shows up, and he doesn't show up so that he can cover it ever again. He came to pack it up, take it out, destroy it. Now, wait a second now. And not only that, spray you with bat spray. Y'all remember Batman? And if you, if you saw Batman or saw who Batman really was, he'd take out the can of bat spray and spray you, and you'd forget. Y'all remember that? All y'all used to watch the old Batman show? Hallelujah. He had a can of bat spray. You know, you, you, know, you saw him. He was, he was uh, 
Bruce Wayne. Okay, and Robin was Dick Grayson. Okay, you saw him and, and you figure out, oh, that's Batman and Robin. And you start talking about it and he say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But shh, you wake up and you, they go, hey, Bruce. They had no remembrance. They had no remembrance. So see, Jesus came and took, he went to your closet, unloaded, you saw him do it. Oh, glory to God. Took everything out from the beginning of time. Everything you've ever done. Everything you've ever said. Everything that's been covered and covered and covered and covered and covered. He came once and for all. He unloaded that closet. Took it out to the truck. Took it down to the, the incinerator. Burn it up. There's no more. It's, it's, it's destroyed. It's removed. And then you came back to your house. And you're sitting there. Yeah. But you know. You know, you know there's, there was all that stuff. And he sprayed you with some Holy Ghost uh, memory spray. And the Bible says this. He purged our conscience. See, the Bible says that those things couldn't do anything because of the conscience. You still remembered it. But he came to purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hallelujah. You open up that closet and say, man, that's the cleanest closet I've ever seen. And you don't even remember that it was full of, you know, adultery and fornication and thievery and, you know, and, and stealing and, you know, and robbing and shooting and killing. All that stuff is gone. And you look at that closet and it's a clean slate. You think, man... That's a great closet. I can put all kinds of good stuff in there. Hallelujah. Amen. And the devil comes by. Yeah, I snuck in here last week and opened up that closet. It was full of all kinds of stuff. And you look over at Jesus and he said, it's under the blood. And what's under the blood stays under the blood. Now, Vegas may say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What gets under the blood stays under the blood. Hallelujah. What that happens in Vegas is shadow from the housetops. I told, I told someone who went out there to get me to go out there for a, 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 a music show, show equipment and stuff, and I called him up on the phone and I said, hey, what happens in Vegas is, is written down in heaven. <laughs> they love that. The wife did too. Yeah, remember that. <laughs> Hallelujah. But Christ being a high priest, verse 11, of good things to come by a greater and more perf perfect tabernacle made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He annihilates the authority of sin. He annihilates the past of sin. See, when you get born again, you get a clean slate. Well, what happens if I mess up after I get saved? Thank God for the blood, and thank God for the advocate. You go to him, you repent. Now, I don't care what any stinking body says on the planet. If you sin, you repent. You ask God to forgive you, and he cleanses that just like it was, and now you're back to that clean slate again. Don't listen to these bozos who tell you that, that you don't repent for when you sin. You do. Why? For your conscience sake, at, at, at least. For your conscience sake, at least. It's not sin consciousness to repent for sin you've committed after you got saved. Now, it's sin consciousness to keep bringing it back up after you repented for it and put it under the blood. That's sin consciousness. Sin consciousness is, you know, well, man, man back when I was 15, I did such and such. And I, I robbed the store down there and took 50, 50 pieces of stick candy out of the jar and ran off with it. You know, and, and I feel so bad. That's sin consciousness. You're reminded of the past. But if you, 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 just, you just went out this week and drank a six-pack and got lit up, you know, you need to repent. You don't need to come to church and go, whoa, I'm under grace. It don't matter. No, you need to repent. Why? The blood of Jesus was given to give you a clean slate and then be there to apply and keep that slate clean when you mess up. But you get a clean slate from the beginning. So everything that happened before is gone. Woo! What's the name on the front of this building? Oh, I thought it said First Frozen Chosen Church. We are not the church of the first chosen chosen. You ought to be excited about the fact you got a clean slate. And you should also be excited about the fact that, man, once you came in, I think, it's, I think the, the message of 1 John 1, 9, that's the true message, not the goofed up thing. They've even got ones where they found a couple of Bibles that somebody says not in the original Greek, and they took 1 John 1, 9 out. 
because it messed up their crazy grace teaching. And they start quoting these Bibles. Well, this Bible, all Bible scholars agree that this is the Bible. No, they don't. The all is the people in your little circle. You know, the, the revision of this uh, scholars. Started finding a couple of Bibles that, that somebody came up with out of, out of Europe somewhere. And they said, it's not even in there. So we're, it's not in the Bible. We don't repent when we sin. If you've got to go get new written Bibles, the, the Jehovah's Witness did that with their Bible. Called Jesus and put the, the, the uh, preposition, I guess it's a son of God. Added that to there because their scholars said it was in the Greek. And that's that they used that to prove that Jesus wasn't divine. Hello. Are you here? Are you going home? See, when you start messing with rewriting the Bible and trying to find translations that leave stuff out that supports your theory, you better leave your theory alone. The blood of Jesus, now think about this. The blood of Jesus is not an entity unto itself. It is uniquely and forever attached in its origin and so with the Son of God or with the Lamb of God who came to redeem us from our sin. Therefore, great price was paid. You were not redeemed with silver and gold or corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ. His blood was shed to purchase you out of the authority of sin. Paul writes, says, how are we who are dead to sin? Let's put it this way. How are we who, I'm going to paraphrase this in a way that may, may help make sense to what he was trying to say. How are we who are dead or have been delivered from the authority of sin able to continue to live in sin? How are we that are dead to sin able to live any longer therein? How are we who've been delivered from the authority of sin? How? By the precious blood of Christ. How can you continue to live in that which you were delivered from? And justify it because you're under some grace. How? Paul asked that question. How? He even got rhetorical. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? His, his answer was, God forbid. Why? Taking, now see, if you believe Paul wrote Hebrews like I do, his understanding of the blood. Now, I didn't say you have to, to go to heaven. I just believe he did. Okay. If his understanding of the blood of Jesus is thus, that it's the precious blood of Christ, and we've been redeemed with that, amen, that, you know, he, Christ entered in once and for all to obtain an eternal redemption with, with that blood, and it's uniquely tied to our redemption, and that blood was shed, he entered in once and for all, he went in with his own blood to cleanse the heaven. He, listen, think about this now. Everything that was in the earthly tabernacle was cleansed by the blood of bulls and goats. Jesus' blood cleansed heavens. Then he went into before the Father and got to the mercy seat and cleansed the mercy seat. And redemption, not atonement, but redemption for mankind was settled. You're bought. Sin no longer has an authority. Now let me say this. You know, in, in, uh, in slave days, and this, listen, there's still slavery around the world. Just, you know, America has been delivered from it. There's, they're, 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 right now, Charlotte, North Carolina is, is the number one place in the United States for the sex slave trade. I don't know if you knew that or not. The reason we know that is we went out to D.C. a few years ago, and a friend of Jesse's and Shannon's they went to High Point University with was the uh, work for Kay Hagan's office. And we went and had lunch in the Senate cafeteria with him, and he told us. The Senate knows this. Charlotte, North Carolina is the, the trading place for sex slaves. Right here in our state. It's happening right 90 miles down the road. So slavery is still going on. But under the slavery, see, you could sell a slave somewhere else. You could, be, you could buy that slave from somebody else. In America, in Africa, wherever slave trade is taking place, and it's taking place all over the world. Okay? Jesus came, and we were slaves to sin. And he bought us. He bought us. We've been liberated from the, the authority of sin, but we've been purchased with a great price. And now we're to honor God and serve God with our spirit and our bodies. Why? Because 
we weren't redeemed with silver and gold. We weren't bought at a bartering station. Jesus came and shed his blood to liberate us from the authority of sin, from Satan's dominion over us, but not so we could go do whatever we wanted to do, but so we could come into a bond slave relationship with him. We love him. We honor him. We serve him with all of our heart, soul, and our body. We serve him with everything we got. We owe him a great price that we can. Ne You'll never be able to repay the Lord for what he did. And you can't really try to repay him, but you should live for him. Out of honor and respect and love for what he did for you. He bought you back. He bought you so that you could come back into relationship and fellowship with the Father and exist as you were intended to exist. Here's the thing. There was no other way for you to be brought back in the Father's house except be bought. There was no path for you to be brought back in to the Father's house except a purchase transaction. Glory to God. And Jesus purchased us. While we were dead in our trespasses and sin, while we were bound under Satan's authority, while we were the children of the devil, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will fulfill. John 8 says, 844. Wow. Say wow. Say it backwards. Wow. wow. Say it upside down. Mom. There we go. All right. Wow. The only way to get you out of Satan's domain is to buy you. But silver and gold wouldn't do it. The blood of bulls and goats and calves wouldn't do it. Are you here? All the gold on the earth wouldn't do it. Heaven itself couldn't do it. You couldn't hawk off all of heaven and buy a man can back. God showed us the way from the very beginning, the shedding of blood. No man's blood was good enough because it was all tainted. Y'all here? I said, no man's blood was good enough because it was all tainted. You couldn't, you, know, you couldn't take a slave and free all the slaves with one slave. You couldn't have a slave come down and say, I'm going to sell myself. To, you couldn't do it. It wouldn't do it. What, his value wasn't enough. Fallen, there's no fallen man's value that was enough to redeem all of man. That's why God had to send his own son made in the likeness of sinful flesh. He who knew no sin was made sin. His blood was precious. His blood was the only blood flowing through human flesh that was not tainted with sin. When you got one of a kind of something, it's of great value. How many of you have ever been to the Smithsonian and seen the hidden knight uh, emerald? They found they got an emerald in the, in, in the Smithsonian about this big. It's found in the Hidden Night Mine hit down here off of, you know, near Morganton. It's on loan to the Smithsonian. It's huge. Huh? It's equivalent to the size of a two-liter drink bottle. Wouldn't you like to have that? And put it on my rain. It goes on the six-finger giant. My name is Amoya Dactia, Montilla, whatever. Indigo Montoya. You killed my father prepared to die. Just so you know, that's going to be on the movie tavern over here at Four Seasons on one of the retro nights in the next month and a half. The Princess Bride. You can go see it on the big screen. When you got one of a kind of something, to get, you know, you get rare. black diamonds are rare, like super rare. But they're, they're worth phenomenal amounts of money. There's, we got all these rubies and diamonds and you know, all these different jewels. They're, they're worth, when you get the rare ones, they're worth more. Jesus' blood was the only blood on the planet. Now, it wasn't the only blood ever on the planet. 
it was the only blood on the planet. Adam had that blood until he sinned. He had, he had spotless blood until he sinned. Once he sinned, all mankind was sold under that sin because the blood was passed on and passed on. But Jesus came. And his blood was spotless blood. His blood was precious blood. Glory to God. His blood was of great value and price. His blood was shed. We were deemed not with corruptible things of the hands of men. Not with silver and gold. But with his own blood. I say, everybody say, but with his own blood. I say, with his own blood. And the Bible says those high priests went in every year, year after year after year. They kept offering their sacrifice. But Jesus came. And he walked on the earth. And Satan attempted to, to trick him up. Satan attempted to get him into sin. Satan get in, attempted, to get, attempted to get him to bow his knee. Satan attempted to get him to falter. He just kept saying, it's written, it's written, it's written. And then when he shed his blood, and he went, he went and was paid the penalty for the judgment of God, and he came back up. Remember when he got up, he said this, to Mary when she tried to get him at the temple. <clears throat> he said, now King James says, touch me not. That's not what it says in the Greek. It says, clutch me not. Don't grab me. Right. Now, it wasn't that she was going to taint what he was doing. It's what he wasn't done. He said, clutch me not. Greek. The Greek says, clutch me not. For I have not yet ascended to my father and to your father and to my God and to your God. But go tell the brethren and Peter what you've seen. Why? Because see, she got him on the way up. He was heading to heaven to take his blood and to go do what the high priest had done on the earth three days earlier. They walked around that tabernacle and that temple and that well, temple and did all that work. But see, remember, the veil got rent when he died on the cross. I mean, don't you know the priests were outside the holiest of all was sitting out there when that thing written to they 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 probably had a hissy fit because they thought they were getting ready to die because only the high priest could see in there. They're standing out there and they're rip, and they're probably thinking, oh, I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything. No. <laughs> they had to be doing something like that. They knew. They knew. They, they're probably standing with the rope on the guy's leg going. What do we do now? <laughs> I know they had to be, they had to be a messed up place right there because everything they knew and believed was just messed up. Hello. But what the high priest was doing three days earlier, Jesus came back up and said, don't clutch me, Mary. I'm not done. That's what he was telling her. I'm not done with what I got to do. I've got to finish my work. And then he ascended up into heaven and took his blood. And he marched right down. The Bible says he led captivity captive. All those Old Testament saints that were in Abraham's bosom. Now, a few got, got, got a little smart aleck and, and stopped off, picked up the body and went and talked to folk. If you read over there in the end of Matthew, 50, 50, verse 54, 57 of one of those latter chapters, it says that many of those saints came up and, and walked the streets, and many were seen of many. Can you imagine sitting down to dinner and kind of talking about great, 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 great grandfather David? And the door opens up, and there's David. Guys, just came to tell you, you're my posterity. I saw the Lord. He's been raised from the dead. Believe on Jesus. That'll mess up your meal. I mean, if just my great grandfather showed up, I would mess up your meal. You know? But Jesus took out, they all, they're all out there waiting to see him go in. He goes into the heavenly holiest of holies. He walks in, he does, does all the things that the priests were doing outside the outer court in the holiest place, the holy place, and then he goes into the holiest of all. And he walks up before the presence of the Father, and there's the mercy seat, and it's, it's tainted by sin. Now, in the spirit, I guarantee you could see it. You could see that, I know in the spirit you could have seen the tainting of the sin. And Jesus comes in with his own blood. The first and only thing, the first time since the fall of Adam that something could come in there that could cleanse this. And, and then Jesus puts his blood on there. And they all wait. Because the father still has to accept it. And as they watched the blood of Jesus eradicate the stain of sin from the very mercy seat of God, from where Adam's authority went. Heaven is now cleansed. And the Father says, accept it. Now, Jesus didn't go sit down. 
Hello? I'll be back in 40 days. He turns around, takes off, runs down, and starts preaching to the other guys for 40 days. Ten days before that, he takes it, he comes out and sits down. Day of Pentecost was 50 days. Jesus was, was ascended on the 40th day. There was 10 days there. He, 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 so he left. You accept the blood? Great. I'm out of here. I'll be back. Came back 40, 40 days later. He shows back up to sit down. He takes his blood, cleanses it. Heaven's cleansed. He goes back down there and walks and talks with them, fellowships with them, teaches them. <coughs> Remember the two disciples that were walking on the road and he comes and joins us to them and they're talking about you know, all the things that have happened with Jesus and he starts at Moses and the law and opens up and expounds to them and shows them that Jesus is the Christ and they're all sitting there and then he just disappears and they realize <laughs> and Jesus was just talking to us, dude. And they run in, hey, we saw Jesus! He kept doing that. They'd be, they sit there, sitting there having dinner. Boom, walk through the wall. Hey, guys, I just went to heaven and I cleansed it. Satan's authority is broken. My, you, you know for, for millennia, the priest went in with, with bull blood and goat blood. Hallelujah. And they put it on the altar, the mercy seat, of, uh, and got your sins covered. I went out there and just cleansed it all up. I just got, doing, got done having a, a cleansing that's forever settled. And as a matter of fact, believe on me, you won't even, you won't even have the consciousness that you were a sinner. You're now conscious of being righteous. Hallelujah. You don't, have to, you don't have to come back here next year and offer a sacrifice for what you did all this year and all the years before. You can come to the throne of grace and go, Father, thank you for your love and your mercy. I messed up yesterday about 3 o'clock. I did such and such, forgive me. And Jesus looks over at the Father and says, my blood's on the mercy seat. This is forgiven. And you don't have to come back next week and repent again. It's wiped. It's wiped. It's gone. So you can have, you know, how many know there's a difference between being pardoned and being expunged? So you can get a pardon for what you've done. All it says is the, the, the government or the state offers you continual forgiveness for crimes you committed. There's still some, a lot of times, you know, you can get pardoned, but, you know, you can still, there's still things maybe because you were a felon, you, you can't get this, you can't do that, there's certain things. You, but if it, your record gets expunged, it's like you never did it. You're not pardoned. The record is wiped clean. Heaven didn't pardon us. We got sponged. When Satan comes, we can look at him and say, what are you talking about? Yeah, I remember on July the 22nd, 1978, you did this. Oh, yes, you did. You remember. It's in your brain. You, you remember doing it. You remember? No. You're lying. Nope. My record was sponged by the blood of Jesus. It's like I never did it. I said, it's like I never did it. And as far as God's concerned, I never did it. Satan can walk in there and say, now you're God, you know everything. You know Ed Taylor was, set, was here on this date and he did such and such. And the father goes, what? What's that? The blood of Jesus, my son, the precious blood of the lamb. Though his sins were red as scarlet, they're white as wool. I have removed his iniquities as far as the east is from the west. I have no remembrance of that. His record is expunged. There's nothing to accuse you for. Now, this is what, this, now sin consciousness is remembering that. And letting it govern you. That's sin consciousness. I'm just so unworthy. I mean, I'm telling you back 20 years ago, I did such and such. And I just don't deserve anything from God. That's sin consciousness. It is not sin consciousness to sin and go repent. As a matter of fact, repenting will cleanse your conscience from the dead work to serve the living God because the blood of Jesus will apply to it and wash it clean for the present sin. Hello? You got people teaching not to repent. You, it, that's, that's a message of the devil. Why? Because if our heart condemns us not, then have we confidence toward God. And if, we ever, and, and if we have confidence to our God, we know 
that whatever we ask him, he heareth us. See, we have confidence to what? Not repenting for sin will hurt your faith. What? It, you lose your confidence. So I say amen. Hallelujah. Anybody get blessed? Anybody love Jesus? Hallelujah. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.